Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'd like first to express my uh, thanks to CEFAS for hosting this event, to the organizing committee, and to Professor uh, Habers, the director, and for all of you. A special welcome also for the ambassador of Greece, Mr. Bababakis, who honored us with his presence. Uh, also, warm or cold breezing welcome to my students, especially postgraduate students who uh, are present tonight. Our tema is the interaction between Arab and Greek cultures in late antiquity and, Air and Middle Ages. The common historical background of the people of the Eastern Mediterranean area played a very important role from the prehistoric area till today in forming and transforming uh, their present and future. The continuous symbiosis of the different tribes and peoples of that area, mostly under an imperial government, had created the basis from the very beginnings of history for an unbroken conscious and unconscious intercultural dialogue. The need for peaceful coexistence and fruitful cooperation had paved the way to invent, support and accept various forms and means of communication. Through the link, a long history, the diversity within and among the populations in languages, thought patterns, traditions, religions, and dogmas played a decisive role in accepting a non-dogmatic common instrument of expression as a modus vivendi. One of the most active and long-lasting instruments of communication is Greek language. Arabia and Greece. It is a historical common place that, due to its uh, geostrategic position at the crossroads of ancient worlds between Orient and West, Arabia, the cradle of the Arabs, has had by way of interest and necessity close political, cultural, commercial uh, relationships with ancient states, empires, and civilizations, in particular with the Greeks. Historical accounts have recorded a multitude of events reflecting the close interaction between Arabia and Greece, Roma and Byzantium. In this regard, I expect the present paper to shed light on the various aspects and limitations of such historical relationships which would be of a significant importance to view of the lessons that can be learned from them. Arabs and Greeks. The first Arabist orientalists speaking in terms of history are actually the writers of, Greek, of ancient Greeks. The study of the ancient Greek and Roman writers, historians and geographers, approve that the Arabs were not unknown in the classical Mediterranean antiquity. The Arabs ethnologically and Arabia geographically attracted the attention of Herodotus, Zenon, Posidonius, Eratosthenes, Artemidoros, Strabon, Plinius, Ammianus Marcellinus, Arianos, and earlier even Homerus, Hesiod, and Aeschylus. The nomenclature of the Arabs. The term Sarakini, since the fourth century of our era and later on, replacing mostly the term Arabis Skinites, according to Amianus Marcellino. Greek sources refer to the inhabitants of Arabia in different, with different names and characteristics. Sarakini, Mazikis, Camillari, 
Ellen, Arabs, Aravi, Aravites, Barbari, Likitis eh, er, eh, Erimu, eh, Assiri, Hagarini, eh, Sons of Agar, eh, Sons of the Desert, etc. The civilizational and cultural contacts that the Arabs had with their neighbors should have their roots in early antiquity. The cultural exchange of the Arabs, which had written down by the ancient historians, defined the character of their relations with the other nations. The Arabs in antiquity export silk, spices, smyrna, incense, and other luxurious products, and import everything. According to Strabo, the most ancient reference to the Arabs can be found in Homer's, in his Odyssey, Rhapsody IV, who refers to them as Erymbus, where Strabon and Posidonius identify them with the term Arabs, Arabius. There are many names and forms given to the inhabitants of Arabia through the Greeks and their language. Erembus, Arabius, Arabius, Arabs, Skinites, Sarakini, Saracens, Agarini, Ismailites. According to the Greek writers, we have two qualities of uh, nomenclature with their semiotics, especially the medieval category, antiquity and medieval period, that is to say, before and after Christ. Eschilos. Early classical reference is in Eschilos, the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 5th century BC, who in his uh, theatrical work Prometheus, Prometheus uh, mentions Arabs as remote land, Arabia as a remote land, whence come warriors with sharp pointed spears, also Magus Arabus mentioned in the Persians as one of the commanders of Xerxes' army. It is in Greek writing that we find for the first time the toponymy Arabia. It is in Greek that the term Saracens first becomes common in all European languages. Herodotus. And after him, most Greek and Latin writers use the place name Arabia to mean the entire peninsula and all its inhabitants, including southern Arabia and eastern desert of Egypt. Herodotus provides us with more information, comparing them with other nations. In his first book of history, Cleo, he says, for example, the Arabs, Arabi, give the name of Aphrodite, Al-Alilatis, which, al which referred into the Quran as one of the three daughters of God, Banatullah. Here we can remark, perhaps, the first or earliest phase of translation movement from Greek into Arabic, culminated in Baghdad in the first half of the 9th century uh, forwards. He added to a great information that the Arabs were never subject to the king of the Persians and did not pay poll tax. He refers also to their products, dressings, and weapons. According to Herodotus, the main social characteristics of the Arabs is the stability in their agreement. Aspects of Arab political and social life during the 5th century are well described by Herodotus. He remark, his remarks draw attention on the Arab political entities and their significance and impact in the events of the time. They could set up powerful armies trained and equipped with various weapons. Strabon, in his Geographica, provides us also with important reports, among others, he emphasizes the independent character of the Arabs, especially 
in the case of Alexander the Great. He describes also Arabia with its geography, tribes, and nations. We have stations, forms, and means of diachronic communication between Greek and Arabic culture as well as languages. The rich, uh, rich history of that region provides us with some historical stations as well as diverse effective channels, forms and ways of creating common ground of co-understanding. The Hellenistic era, the Roman period, the appearance and the spread of Christianity, the religious persecutions, the pre-Islamic Arab-Byzantine relationships, the rise of Islam, and the cohabitation with conquered peoples of the eastern provinces of Byzantium, built the main historical stations where Greek and Arabic language had arranged their long life meetings, rendezvous in the past. Main stations. In the course of the long and unbroken history of the two languages, there were some striking and effective stations that brought closer both Greeks and Arabs, as well as Greek and uh, Arabic-speaking peoples, so that it could be considered as a turning point in their evolutional steps. The first and second Greek colonization between the 10th and the 7th century BC, in particular, on the eastern Mediterranean shores, together with their positive historical dimensions and consequences for the sake of the continuity of their civilizations, partially in different name and partially in different forms. Classical period, 5th and 4th century BC, where the Greek intellect, Diania, reaches its peak in every aspect of mental activities. Hellenistic period, Alexander the Great's expedition and the creation of a new world order ecumenism by collapsing multifarious forms of borders, by bringing closer and together different seemingly peoples, cultures, intellectuals, thinkers, perceptions, conceptions, traditions, religions, dogmas, institutions, languages, dialects, creating in this way the necessary presuppositions for cohabitation in every aspect of life, even in hopes, ambitions, and options. The successors of Alexander the Great, the Ptolemies in Egypt and Seleucids in Great uh, Syria and Persia, had established a great historical bridge connecting in this way peoples, religions, and cultures in an identity transcendence level. The political choice of such way of governance acted as a protecting shield against the growth of tribal, ethnic, and religious egoism of their subject peoples. The meaning and the value of the Hellenistic period for both Greeks and peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean area in particular the Arabs and their language, is of vital significance for their common long-run future. It pushed the historical process of bringing nearer and dearer, racially and culturally, two historically different worlds, the Greco-Roman and the Semitic one. At that time, Greek influence upon the Arabic language was indirect. It exercised the, its impact on the more active North Semitic group of languages that is Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, and that of the Nabataeans of Petra and of Palmyra, Tadmor. This precise given time and space was of fundamental importance for the intercultural future of the Greco-Roman, Semitic, and Asian worlds. It furnished the historical arrangements and 
political protocols for the Greco-Arab meetings with the, its serious dimensions and consequences for the two languages, not only as instruments, but also as a bearer and transporter of civilizations for both East and West. The language does not compose simply a totality of words, nor each word each word is simply a set of letters. Each word is a carrier of an idea, of a lifestyle. For this reason, perhaps, one may understand the British poet Shelley, uh, famous saying, we are all Greeks, our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts have their root in Greece. The Roman, the Roman era adopted nearly the same way of their predecessors in keeping contact and close communication with their neighbors in the area, using different means and forms. Roman authorities used to establish military alliances in order to protect their southeastern borders against the Persian invasions as well as the raids of Arab tribes. Moreover, Rome also used to sign trade agreements with the different tribal alliances and tribes on the caravan roads in order to protect the east-west trade routes through Arab Peninsula. Even by invading Arabia itself as it happened in 524 BC under the leadership of the Roman prefect of Egypt, Aelius Gallus, alongside with the assistance of the Nabataean uh, authorities. The role of Petra, at first and later of Palmyra, during the Hellenistic Roman and Proto-Byzantine period, brought nearer the Greek into the arms of the Arabic language. It is worth mentioning that both Petra and Palmyra were not only vivid international commercial stations, but also world intercultural, mostly bilingual stations, connecting not only East and West through the international transit trade, but in particular the Semitic and Greco-Roman Mediterranean worlds. The archaeological excavations and findings brought into light many serious data, mostly in bilingual forms as an evidence of the earlier cohabitation of both languages. The appearance of Christianity and its relatively widespread acceptance among the inhabitants of different tribal and urban parts of Arabia in multitudinous forms and means, mainly through the official and non-official missionaries, monasteries and monks, is of great interest. During this highly important Proto-Byzantine period, we trace the early translation of the Christian scriptures. There were also active participations of the Arabs in the ecclesiastical affairs, especially among the Arabs of Palestine and of the Ghassanids. The question of monophysitism is well known in the Eastern Church history. The role of the historians, too, in eastern Syria, Mesopotamia, and of the Gulf area cannot be denied or uh, easily ignored. The military alliance, Foidrati, during the pre-Islamic period between the Byzantines and the Arabs, continued the earlier Hellenistic and Roman tradition in their political methods and military choice in the area. Characteristic examples can be considered those of the Ghassanids, Udra and Tagli, as well as the Byzantium's official attempt of Christianization, as well as the ideological protecting shield against the Persian invasion and their efforts for Judaization of the already Christianized Yemenites in South Arabia in particular. Or, at the same time, 
Byzantium tried to establish a direct communication with Mecca itself in order to broaden its proximate influence and expand its presence among the Arabs of Western Arabia against any further expansion of Persians, especially in South and West Arabia, during the highly critical and historically crucial 6th and early 7th century for the imperial capital. Important and major station in the communication of the Greek with the Arabic language is the appearance and expansion of Islam, particularly, uh, particularly in the area of the eastern and southern Mediterranean. In Bilad Sham, Great Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt and Libya, during the decisive decade of Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph. The cohabitation of the Arabs as minority with the conquered peoples of those provinces as majority, whether they are Greeks, Greek-speaking or thinking peoples or others, inhabitants, in customs, in institutions, in habits, way of living and thinking, etc., was not a simply process of military occupation and or of political superiority and or of economic exploitation, but essentially speaking and historically observing, it brought together and in direct contact both Arabic and Greek cultures and languages for more than three centuries, especially in Egypt, in a, in a mode of an effective coexistence and complementary co-function. The evidence of the papaya, and the bilingual in particular, is very co uh, concrete and of great historical value for both languages and their future co-productions in numerous cultural and scientific fields, which will be culminated during, during the golden age of the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. In the process of that established uh, cohabitation, there are many historical factors which played their vital role. First of all, there are the war prisoners who played the major role and the utmost effective part as immediate and direct means and form of transportation and implantation of different models of thinking and living. Secondly, and also of great importance, is the military forces as occupying manpower with its needs for leading a civil way of living after the conquest and during their settlement accompanied with the inherent sense of man by nature is sociable and have the ability of exercising a way of, of friendship attack beyond the sound of weapons. This leads to more sociable tendencies which is almost an inner and inherent need as a first result of that human way of approaching we can trace in many illegal and later uh, legal mixed marriages such category of marriages will prepare the way and bathe the path towards a new generation among the conquerors and the conquered here a new need is created it is the need of passaging and or messaging. The level of communication is naturally elevated from uh, the physical into the sentimental as well as into the mental and intellectual standard of interacting. Thirdly, the foundation of the Arab cities at first on the edge of Arabia and later in the heart of the conquered lands is a station socio-economic and cultural consideration. Characteristic examples are the first three cities built between uh, 638 and 2642 
by the Arab state immediately after the rise of Islam and during the early conquest precisely during the time of Omar the second caliph. The new established primary Arab cities such as Al-Kufa, Al-Basra and Al-Fustat or Tufusatr are of great significance in this direction. In Al-Fustat, the first Arab capital of Egypt, which replaced Alexandria and continued the historic, historical role of the ancient Memphis, one may find the seat of Arab Egypt a newborn civilization. Al-Fustat, the later Cairo, continued to exercise its historical duty during the first centuries of Islam. Damascus will be the third Arab capital of the Arab Islamic State. Since the rise of Islam, it is the heart of the former Hellenistic world and the east-west cross, uh, crossroads in terms of geography and civilizational interaction. The cradle of multifarious peoples, religions, and civilization is now inherited by the Arabs. But then, the so-called Athens of the Orient, which will play its historical role by its term as main link for peoples, religions, philosophies, theologies, spiritualities, cultural expressions, languages, and dogmas, we can also add here the famous city of al qairawan the Arab Carthage of al maghrib The next also essential station is the administration of the former eastern provinces of Byzantium, which played also a profound role in the complementary coexistence and co-functioning of both Greek and Arabic. It is due to this cohabitation of the two languages as unique means for covering the administrative needs of the caliphate in Egypt that Arabic language essentially and historically managed to become a proper instrument for the transmission of Hellenism into the medieval Europe, reactivating and leading the Western European medieval perception into it is modern way of thinking intellectually, mentally, and even sentimentally. The rise of Islam gave the idea. The Arab conquest paved the way. The Umayyad secured the road. The Abbasids adopted and assimilated the rich heritage of the, of the conquered peoples from China to Iberia granting the chance of one official language and one ideology, the Arabic and the Islamic thought or way of thinking. The existence of common means of communicating and way of thinking, that is Arabic and Islamic respectively, among different peoples, institutions, way of living, way of thinking and expressing, even of cooking, eating and dressing, and countless cultures and climates upon the land of Dar, uh, of Dar al-Salam was the biggest history station in world cultural dialogue. At that, time, at that given time and space, both Greek and Arabic languages faced each other in equal terms of dialogue, of cooperation and peaceful coexistence for the welfare of a human being beyond name and form, face and faith. The translation movement was multidimensional in time and space. It was primarily born in Damascus and later culminated in Baghdad, especially during the Abbasid era. In, in Al-Andalus, the Western Caliphate of the Umayyads in Sicily, even under its Norman occupation, and in Egypt of the Fatimids, where the antagonism was not only military and commercial, but mainly ideological and cultural. So the political and dismemberment of the Arab Islamic Caliphate 
acted positively for the sake of civilization through the multiplication of the cultural antagonistic centers in Dar al-Islam from Central Asia and India into Cairo and Cordoba. Last but not least, is the modern station, which has to do with the very beginnings and not only of the Egyptian but also of the Arab Renaissance in general. At that historical moment, it is in France where Greek and Arabic met each other again, had their rendezvous, Europe by its turn, and for cultural and historical repayment reasons, facilitated the Greek thought or Hellenism of modern times to come into indirect communication with the Arabic through its translation, mainly from French into Arabic. A special reference should be done to the theater and epics. In this station of modern times, we can easily observe the continuity of the intercultural dialogue between East and West in, in the rebirth form of the coexistence and of the complementary co-function of both Greek and Arabic language. As the medieval translation movement resulted in the establishment of the primary Arab Islamic universities in Baghdad, Cairo and Cordoba, the modern translation movement, uh, similarly to the medieval one, led to the establishment of Greek and Latin departments of studies at the Egyptian universities, to the foundation and flourishing of the Arab theater proving that meaning and not the clash, the meeting and not the clash of culture. Thank you. For your <laughs> Let me just as very few words in Arabic. <laughs> بدءا بتواجد العنصر اليوناني بجوار حضارات الشرق الأدنى القديم وخاصة في وادي النيل وسواحل بلاد الشام من خلال الهجرة اليونانية في القرن العاشر والقرن السابع قبل الميلاد وهذا وصل إلى قوته بعد حملة الإسكندر الأكبر على الشرق في أواخر القرن الرابع قبل الميلاد وبعد وفاة الإسكندر الأكبر وتأسيس أسرة الأسرة الحاكمة للبطالمة في مصر والسلوقيين في بلاد الشام وفي إيران انتقل انتقل الثقل الحضاري من اليونان الأم إلى سواحل بلاد الشام أو إلى قلب العالم الهيلينيستي حيث نجد الإسكندرية غزة بيروت دمشق وحران مراكز للحضارة اليونانية في ذلك الوقت بعد مع ظهور الإسلام وبدء الفتوحات العربية الإسلامية وخاصة في العشر سنوات لعمر بن الخطاب دخلت كل الولايات الشرقية البيزنطية تحت الحكم العربي الإسلامي وهكذا تحول قلب الحضارة الهيلينستية شرق البحر الأغم المتوسط إلى قلب الخلافة أو قلب العالم العربي الإسلامي وهذا أن العالم العربي الإسلامي أو الفكر العربي الإسلامي أصبح الوريث الوحيد للثقافة الهيلينستية في تلك المنطقة هذا التلاقي الحضاري ما بين الفكر العربي الحامل لراية الإسلام والمتقبل لرأي الآخر دون التدخل في تحويره طبقا لما هو عليه أدى إلى مولد الفكر العربي الإسلامي وأدى إلى حوار قوم بين اللغة العربية واللغة اليونانية وبالذات في مصر لمدة ثلاث قرون بعد الفتح العربي لمصر هذا التلاقي بين العربية واليونانية وخاصة في مصر بقرار الخليفة عمر بن الخطاب حول اللغة العربية أو طور اللغة العربية من لغة شعر ومشاغر ومشاعر إلى لغة علم تمكنت من ترجمة كل التراث الهيليني اليوناني في الفلسفة في الطب في الفلك في الرياضيات وحتى في علم النجوم أو علم التنجيم
استمرت هذه الحركة في بغداد وانتقلت إلى القاهرة ومن القاهرة إلى القيروان ومن القيروان إلى قرطبة في الأندلس في المغرب العربي وبعد نهاية العصور الوسطى بعد الفتح بعد التواجد العثماني في المنطقة وبعد على حملة نابليون على مصر عام 1798 دخل العالم العربي في اتصال مباشر مع فرنسا التي كانت في ذلك الوقت في عصر نهضتها لإحياء التراث اليوناني كامتداد لعصر التنوير في القرن الثامن عشر وأوائل القرن التاسع عشر وهنا أعطت فرنسا الفرصة بسبب بعثات محمد علي إلى فرنسا أعطت الفرصة للفكر العربي المعاصر للتلاقي من جديد مع الفكر اليوناني القديم عن طريق اللغة الفرنسية وهكذا بدأت حركة ترجمة جديدة للفكر اليوناني من اليونانية إلى من الفرنسية إلى العربية وكان رائد هذه الحركة عميد الأدب العربي طه حسين الذي بعد بعد عمل هذا الخالد قام بتأسيس أول قسم للدراسات اليونانية في جامعة القاهرة وأنا سعيد أن أنا وفخور أنني خريج هذا القسم شكرا على هذا ثانك يو